In this episode, we will be looking at the biblical worldview of ancient history. This is the first of three worldviews we must consider. Before we get into the meat of it, we must define some terms. Canon is a Greek word which describes a law of discipline. More specifically, in the English language, it describes the accepted collection of holy books in Christianity. There are several ancient Hebrew books which are not considered holy by Jews or Christians, sent from God for instruction. Some of them are disputed and have not been proven enough to be added to the canon of Scripture. The canon is basically the Bible, the collection of books allowed into the Bible and considered as the Word of God for man. There are different canons as well. The Roman Catholics have a slightly different canon than the Protestants. There are others as well. The Eastern Church has a slightly different canon than the West. Apocrypha comes from another Greek word meaning obscure. The collection of ancient books which are not considered canon or are doubtful are considered apocryphal. Although these books are not a part of the Bible for various reasons, they can still be useful to us from a historical viewpoint. If they are proven to be from a certain time or have been widely read during a certain time, this helps us to understand the society of that time and what their worldview was. In turn, this can help to clarify the canonical text in some instances. When looking at apocryphal books, we must keep in mind that these books are not considered as part of verified scripture for a reason. We must consider what that reason is and how these books must be considered individually. We can't define our beliefs by apocryphal books, but they may be able to shed some historical light on the canonical books, which do define our beliefs. Jews do not use the word canon to describe their collection of holy writings. They use the word Tanakh. The Tanakh does not include any Christian writings. The word Tanakh is an acronym describing three sections of the accepted holy writings. They also use the word Mikra in place of Tanakh. It simply means what is read. The Mikra, or Tanakh, is divided into three sections the Torah, the Nevim, and the Ketuvim. Torah is a collection of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These are the books which were kept in the Holy Ark of the Covenant. To all Judeo-Christian faiths, these books are undisputed as passed down by God through Moses as holy books for the people of Israel. This fact was undisputed by Jesus Christ also. The Nephilim and Ketuvim are the collection of prophets, poets, and histories which make up what Christians call the Old Testament. The Tanakh collection is undisputed as holy writings which were passed down through history, religiously copied and unaltered by the Jewish people. These books are widely accepted, unchallenged by Jews and Christians alike. There are also some ancient Hebrew books which are not part of the Tanakh. In the complete Hebrew record, there are at least five antediluvian or pre-flood books available to us. The first one, of course, is the book of Genesis, which is a part of the Torah. All other pre-flood books are compared to this known authentic book. The first book we will examine is the book of Enoch. Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah and the seventh generation from Adam, as is recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. And Enoch lived sixty-five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty-five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The book of Genesis is canonical, meaning Holy Scripture. The book of Enoch is apocryphal. 
The Book of Enoch cannot be authenticated by archaeological data and must be taken with a grain of salt. We can be sure that Jesus Christ and the Apostles were quite familiar with a Book of Enoch, which was similar to the copy we have today, but we cannot yet prove that this book we have has not been altered in some way through the centuries. The Book of Enoch was read by Christians until the 4th century, when it was banned by the Council of Laodicea in 363 AD. At this council, the Roman Catholic Bible canon was ratified, and non-canonical books were banned and destroyed when found by the Roman government. The Book of Enoch was considered a lost book until the 16th century, and when it was discovered in use by the Ethiopian Church in Northeast Africa, it was recorded in the Gaze language in Ethiopia. This Ethiopian copy of Enoch was considered by many a forgery until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran on the northwest bank of the Dead Sea from 1946 to 1956. A network of caves containing ancient scrolls was searched. Fragments of the Book of Enoch recorded in the Aramaic language were found, which coincide with the reading of the Ethiopic version of Enoch. Although the Ethiopians claim to have protected this and other artifacts religiously and secretly since the time of Solomon, during the height of Israel's power, about 950 BC, when the Queen of Sheba traveled across the Arabian desert to visit King Solomon of Israel. This event is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions, and she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions, and there was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendants of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. She had said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and thy wisdom. Howbeit, I believed not the words until I came, and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed is the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king, to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold and of spices, very great store and precious stones. And there came no more such abundance of spices as those which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The Ethiopian legend gives a more detailed account of the meeting. According to them, Solomon tried to seduce the queen of Sheba, which is easy to believe given the account of his life in the Bible. According to the Ethiopians, she refused him, and he withdrew. She then told him she was leaving the next morning. Solomon then told her she could stay the night in his palace without accepting his proposition as long as she asked nothing else from him. And after she agreed to that, they sat down to dine, and Solomon instructed his servant to put lots of salt in her food. That night, he then instructed the servants to make sure there was no water in the palace except one pitcher by his bedside. In the middle of the night, she awoke thirsty and went looking for water. She only found the pitcher near his bedside and could not resist pouring a glass. When she did so, Solomon awoke overjoyed 
that she had decided to accept his proposal by taking something from him. She then felt obligated or was impressed with him, and she slept with him and left in the morning. However, she bore a son to him in Sheba. She also received copies of some Hebrew books from him which were preserved through the centuries in Ethiopia, which at that time was a part of the very large kingdom of Sheba, which stretched from the Arabian Peninsula into the Horn of Africa. The Sabian kingdom is where Yemen is today. It is also stretched into Ethiopia during the height of its power. By the 8th century BC, the Ethiopians regained independence from the Sabian kingdom. There are also legends in Ethiopia of the Queen of Sheba's sons, descendants, returning to Israel before the siege of Jerusalem in the 6th century BC and taking the Ark of the Covenant back to Ethiopia, where it is claimed to rest today, protected by special priests who guard it with their lives. The Ethiopians then adapted Christianity, which also spread through North Africa. There is an account in the Christian book of Acts, in the Bible, of an Ethiopian eunuch who was in a high position of power in the Ethiopian kingdom. Let's read it. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. And the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go towards the south, to the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. And what it is, is, is it's, he read Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 and 8. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself? or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So Philip began teaching him Isaiah chapter 53 beginning at verse 7 where he was reading. But he read on from there teaching him about Jesus. So let's just start at verse 9 and just see what he read on to. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now these are the verses that Philip was teaching to the eunuch. And these verses are written by Isaiah almost 700 years before Philip. So now we'll continue with Philip and the Ethiopian. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, Here, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. 
And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So what is interesting here is the Ethiopian came to Jerusalem to worship. There was an established connection between the Ethiopian court and the temple in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, which may very well had begun at the time of Solomon. It is also notable that the Holy Spirit intervened directly to bring the gospel of Christ to the Ethiopian courts. The Ethiopian church kept the holy books in secret written in a lost language called Gaze which was eventually decoded and translated into English for us to read today. These accounts cannot be authenticated by any other cultures who had contact with Ethiopia because it was a closely guarded secret. Therefore, we cannot authenticate these claims with the witness of other surrounding cultures as we can with the Hebrew writings. Therefore, we must be careful in putting too much weight into what it tells us. It does, however, clarify many things for us and cannot be ignored, as you will see. In the Dead Sea discoveries, many ancient Hebrew manuscripts have been authenticated as accurate since the time of Christ. The Book of Enoch was also found, but only small fragments were left of it. The fragments do read the same as the modern Ethiopic copies we have, but there is very little of it to compare. If there is ever a discovery of the complete scroll of Enoch's book written in Hebrew and dating to the time of Christ or Aramaic, this would rock the theological world. For now, this has not yet been done. We must be careful when studying such books and making hard conclusions. The book of Enoch is a very large book full of detailed descriptions of Enoch's journeys into the spiritual realm where he walked with God. It also includes fragments from a book claimed to have written by Noah, who also carried the book of his grandfather Enoch on the ark. Enoch tells an epic story of how a number of the angels fell because they lusted after the women of the earth and made babies with them. These children were giants and were called Nephilim. These fallen angels also taught various secrets of heaven to mankind, such as sorcery, metallurgy, enchantments, and weaponry. The result was turmoil and death in the earth. When the cries of the people came to God for judgment, God condemned these fallen angels to be imprisoned in the deepest depths of the earth for a period of time when they will face final judgment. Curiously, the exact location is given to us where these fallen angels are imprisoned, under the Golan Heights a United Nations protected zone between Israel and Syria. The Nephilim, or giants, were part human and part angel, and because of this, when they died, their spirits were eternal, and this is the origin of evil spirits, or demons, who roam the earth to delude and entice men to rebel against God. These evil spirits are condemned to roam the earth doing this until the final judgment. Enoch was asked by the fallen angels to implore God for them, to ask for forgiveness or leniency. This book is far too large to cover in great detail, but I will read God's response to Enoch from the book itself. This demonstrates the demonology presented within the book quite plainly. Enoch Book 1, Chapter 15 and 16 then addressing me, he spake and said, Hear, neither be afraid, O righteous Enoch, you scribe of righteousness, approach hither and hear my voice. Go say to the watchers of heaven, who have sent you to pray for them, you ought to pray for men and not men for you. Wherefore, have you forsaken the lofty and holy heaven, which endures forever, and have lain with women, have defiled yourselves with the daughters of men, and have taken to yourselves wives, have acted like the sons of the earth, and have begotten an impious offspring. 
You, being spiritual, holy, and possessing a life which is eternal, have polluted yourselves with women, have begotten in carnal blood, have lusted in the blood of men, and have done as those who are flesh and blood do. These, however, die and perish. Therefore I have given them wives, that they might cohabit with them, that sons might be born of them, and that this might be transacted upon the earth. But you, from the beginning, were made spiritual, possessing a life which is eternal, and not subject to death forever. Therefore I made not wives for you, because being spiritual your dwelling is in heaven. Now the giants who have been born of spirit and of flesh shall be called upon the earth evil spirits, and on earth shall be their habitation. Evil spirits shall proceed from their flesh, because they were created from above. From the holy watchers was their beginning and primary foundation. Evil spirits they shall be called upon earth, and the spirits of the wicked they shall be called. The habitation of the spirits of heaven shall be in heaven, but upon earth shall be the habitation of the terrestrial spirits who are born on earth. The spirits of the giants shall be like clouds which shall oppress, corrupt, fall, content, and bruise upon the earth. They shall cause lamentation. No food they shall eat, and they shall be thirsty, and they shall be concealed, and shall not rise up against the sons of men, and against women, for they come forth during the days of slaughter and destruction. And as to the death of the giants, wheresoever their spirits depart from their bodies, let their flesh, that which is perishable, be without judgment. Thus shall they perish, until the day of the great consummation of the great world. A destruction shall take place of the watchers and the impious. And now to the watchers who have sent you to pray for them, who in the beginning were in heaven, say, In heaven you have been. Secret things, however, have not been manifested to you, yet you have known a reprobated mystery. And this you have related to women in the hardness of your heart. And by that mystery have women and mankind multiplied evils upon the earth. Say to them, Never, therefore, shall you obtain peace. Now, as most people know, in the four Gospels, there are several accounts of Jesus Christ dealing with demons and casting them out of people who were possessed. Within the entire text of the Bible, demons or evil spirits are very real, so it should be no surprise to read about demonology in these ancient texts. The idea of giants, or Nephilim, also are repeatedly discussed in Hebrew scriptures. We read in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 4, And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. This comes from a chapter in Genesis, a canonical book, which is describing the conditions in the earth prior to the flood, and the reasons why God is bringing the flood. In those days, and also after that, refers to pre- and post-flood days. There are three terms we need to define in this verse. Giants, sons of God, and mighty men. These are all important words to understand. Giants is translated from the Hebrew word Nephilim, which means giant or fallen one. There is another Hebrew word, Rephaim, which refers to also to giants. The race of giants lived in the ancient world and were wiped out during the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites. I will read a few examples of the many verses recorded about giants in the Bible. Numbers chapter 13 verse 33 And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11 to 13. For only Og 
king of Bashan remained of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And this land which we possess at that time, from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites, and to the Gadites. And the rest of Gilead, and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh. All the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of giants. Second Samuel, chapter 21, verse 16 to 22. And this she Benob, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of brass in weight. He, being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him, and smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to do battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibichai the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of jer Orgum, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, when there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. He also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and fell by the hand of David, and by the hand of his servants. And most of us have heard the story of David and Goliath, where the boy David slew the giant Goliath with a sling and a stone, which is recorded in the first book of Samuel, chapter 17. Now back to Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children unto them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. There are two more words or phrases we need to address. Next is the phrase sons of God or in Hebrew it reads Bene Ha Elohim. Now the first thing to note is that Elohim is the plural of El. The Hebrew word El is related to the Phoenician word Baal, or to the Arabic word al a It simply translates as God. It could be considered as one God among many, or as the only God. It is simply the singular form of the word God. Elohim, on the other hand, is the plural form, gods, as meaning of the complete population of the spiritual realm. There are the men and there are the gods, which includes God and his angels, or in different religions, the chief deity and the lesser deities, God and the gods. Therefore, the more accurate translation of Bene ha Elohim would be the sons of the gods as opposed to the daughters of men. There is only one other place in the Hebrew Bible where this phrase, Bene ha Elohim, or sons of the gods, appears, and that is in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Just a note here that in the King James Bible here, the word LORD in all caps is translated from the Hebrew word Jehovah. So here in the book of Job, we see Satan coming to gather among the sons of the gods 
who meet before Jehovah. In the book of Job, Satan accuses Job before Jehovah of only serving God because he is well blessed, and Jehovah allows Satan to test Job. The book goes on to describe his trials and overcoming through faith. The point being made here is that the sons of Elohim is none other than certain angels or watchers, as described in the book of Enoch, when the angels made children with the daughters of men, and they begat giants. In Genesis chapter 6, it says that the children of these sons of Elohim became mighty men of old, or another way of saying it is mighty legendary men, men of renown, or men of great name. We can liken this to Hercules or Achilles from Greek mythology for an example. Hercules was the son of Zeus who had sex with a mortal woman. These mighty men of old spoken of in Genesis were the Nephilim who ruled as gods on earth for a time because of their great strength and agility and stature above and beyond mere mortals. The book of Enoch was widespread among Jews at the time of Jesus Christ, but fell out of use in Jewish learning, according to the Christian father, Tertullian, who lived about 200 AD. He said the Jews stopped using it because it spoke so plainly in its prophecies about Jesus Christ. He was probably referring to the prophecies regarding the Son of Man in the book of Enoch. Here is a sample from one of those prophecies. Enoch, Book 2, Chapter 68, Verse 34 to 69, Verse 4. All of these confess and laud before the Lord of Spirits. They glorify with all their power of praise, and He sustains them. And in all the act of thanksgiving, while they laud, glorify, and exalt the name of the Lord of Spirits forever and ever, and with them he establishes this oath by which they and their paths are preserved, nor does their progress perish. Great was their joy. They blessed, glorified, and exalted because the name of the Son of Man was revealed to them. He sat upon the throne of his glory, and the principal part of the judgment was assigned to him, the Son of Man, Sinners shall disappear and perish from the face of the earth, while those who seduce them shall be bound with chains forever. According to their ranks of corruption they shall be imprisoned, and all their works shall be disappeared from the face of the earth. Nor thenceforward shall there be any to corrupt, for the Son of Man has been seen sitting in the throne of his glory. Everything wicked shall disappear and depart from before his face, and the word of the Son of Man shall become powerful in the presence of the Lord of Spirits. This is the third parable of Enoch. After this, the name of the Son of Man, living with the Lord of Spirits, was exalted by the inhabitants of the earth. It was exalted in the chariots of the Spirit, and the name went forth in the midst of them. From that time I was not drawn into the midst of them, but he seated me between two spirits, between the north and the west, where the angels received their ropes to measure out a place for the elect and the righteous. There I beheld the fathers of the first men and the saints who dwell in that place forever. Okay, so that is one of the messianic prophecies of Enoch. As many know, within all of the four Gospels, Jesus Christ repeatedly refers to himself as the Son of Man. In fact, in the four Gospels, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man 77 times. Knowing that the Book of Enoch was widely read among the Jews at this time, this title would undoubtedly have caused the Jewish listeners to equate this declaration to the Son of Man prophecies contained in Enoch's writings. Also, the things he was saying about himself as the Son of Man, being delivered up and judging the world, are exactly in line with the Son of Man prophecies contained in the book of Enoch. 
The book of Enoch is quoted directly by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. Jude chapter 1 verse 6 states, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. These events are recorded in great detail within the book of Enoch. Also, Jude, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 states, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that the ungodly among them, and of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Enoch chapter 1 9 reads, And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all the flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The book of Enoch also was indirectly quoted by the apostle Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. Several of the Christian church fathers quoted from the book of Enoch. As one example, I will read an excerpt from Justin Martyr, who was tried and beheaded in the second century in Rome for his testimony as a Christian. He spoke openly about the demonic influence on pagan society of his day. Justin Martyr, Second Apology, Chapter 5 God, when he had made the whole world and subjected things earthly to man and arranged the heavenly elements for the increase of fruits and rotation of the seasons and appointed this divine law, for these things also he evidently made for man, committed the care of men, and, of all things under heaven, to angels whom he committed over them. But the angels transgressed this appointment, and were captivated by the love of woman, and begot children, who are those that are called demons, and besides, they afterwards subdued the human race to themselves, partly by magical writings, and partly by fears and the punishments they occasioned, and partly by teaching them to offer sacrifices and incense and libations, of which things they stood in need after they were enslaved by the lustful passions. And among men they sowed murders, wars, adulteries, intemperate deeds, and all wickedness. Whence also the poets and mythologists, not knowing that it was the angels and those demons who had been begotten by them, that did these things to men and women and cities and nations, which they related, ascribed them to God himself and to those who were accounted to be his very offspring, and to the offspring of those who were called his brothers, Neptune and Pluto, and to the children again of these their offspring. For whatever name of each of the angels had given to himself and his children, by that name they called them. And last but not least, the Apostle Paul also agrees with Enoch and with Justin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 to 23, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. The book of Enoch has an abundance of information in it about the fall of the angels and the origin of the demons and the righteous son of man coming to redeem mankind. Although this book cannot be completely authenticated, it does provide us with a detailed backdrop of the biblical worldview 
which is carried forth throughout the Bible and into Christianity. It is also an underlying theme in modern Christianity in different forms. It is, though, an apocryphal book and must be handled as such. We don't know what has been added or removed by men or by demons. We can authenticate the Bible books, but these others we must take with some caution. They do, however, help to clarify the canonical books in general terms. Along with the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a highly fragmented book discovered known as the Book of Giants. This book does follow the narrative of Enoch, with the fall of the angels and their offspring being giants, who were cursed. This book gives a detailed history of the ancient giants. It is, however, highly fragmented and is missing several pieces. Therefore, not much relevant information is contained in it, which gives us any new useful information unknown by other sources. It does, however, show us yet another book on this matter, available to the Jewish community during the lifetime of Jesus Christ. The Book of Jubilees, like the Book of Enoch, fell among the list of banned books after the Council of Laodicea in 363 AD and was considered lost until an Ethiopic version written in the Gaze language was brought to Europe in the 16th century along with the Book of Enoch. The Book of Jubilees was also widely quoted by several early Christian fathers who lived in the first three centuries after Christ. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, 15 complete copies of the Book of Jubilees was discovered, written in Hebrew and mostly, but not completely, authenticating the Ethiopian version. The Book of Jubilees itself claims to have been dictated to Moses by an angel upon Mount Sinai. It covers the time period from the creation of the world until the time of Moses on the mountain. In the Torah, God spoke directly to Moses, not through an angel. The book is called Jubilees because it is divided into 49-year time periods, or Jubilees, also known as the Little Genesis. It largely follows the narrative of the book of Genesis, summarizing it with added details in several places, such as the fall of the angels and the creation of the Nephilim, with some differences. The fall of the angels happens on the first day of creation in this book. In the Ethiopian version, the fallen angels are the sons of Seth, the third child of Adam and Eve, who made it with the daughters of Cain to give birth to the Nephilim. This does raise some doubt for us about the book of Enoch, because since the Ethiopic and Hebrew versions of the book of Jubilees have this big difference, we cannot tell the authenticity of the book of Enoch either, since we have only the Ethiopic version of it. The book of Jubilees also states that Hebrew is the language of heaven, which was lost to mankind until it was taught to Abraham by an angel. The book of Jubilees is extremely well done if it is a forgery. It does have a few very telling errors, which may or may not have been inserted at a later time, specifically stating historical facts from a later time than Moses. Personally, I think it may have been based upon an authentic book at one time, but it does have some verses which are extremely Judaic in nature as compared to the book of Genesis meaning that it does seem to be written by or edited by scribes of a later period. It does closely follow the narrative of the book of Genesis, but it lacks a certain underlying antiquity, which is very apparent in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, as all Holy Scripture, is dictated directly by the Holy Spirit of God, while the book of Jubilees is dictated by an angel. This may account for its inferiority to Genesis. Although angels are extremely intelligent, they are not equal to the Holy Spirit of God. It is no surprise that this book does fall into the category of apocryphal and has been considered such for many centuries. This may have opened it up to being vulnerable to editing while the accepted Holy Scriptures were much more closely guarded. 
This book does have some value for understanding the math regarding jubilees or 49 year periods. It also contains the concept of one week being a seven year period. These concepts are helpful when studying prophetic verse. Also, it does give us a look into the first century thinking on certain issues. We do know it was widely read by the Jews at the time of Christ and by early Christians. Therefore, it does have historical value, but must be carefully read because parts of it are doubtful as to their authenticity. In conclusion, as I have demonstrated, there was a belief among the Hebrews and Christians in Judea at the time of Christ that a certain number of angels sinned by producing children with certain women of the earth whose children were giants and whose spirits became demons when they died. This belief was not disputed by Jesus Christ. In fact, he cast demons out of people, and this narrative was continued by Jude, Peter, Paul, and several early Christian fathers. As Justin Martyr explains, the pagan gods known to the ancient world were just that, mighty men and demons who continued to fool men into serving them. In the next episode, we will explore another popular worldview regarding the ancient world, the ancient aliens. Now don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell if you want to receive notifications.